Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ilko Kruisinga. I hope you're all fine and safe. Uh, I represent the EIP SEC uh, Marketplace uh, project together with my colleague uh, George, who is also vis visible on this slide, uh, the gentleman uh, speaking in the microphone on the bottom right. And together we are organizing a series of uh, webinars around important topics related to um, scaling up of smart city uh, projects, especially from the financial side. This is actually our second uh, webinar. And for this webinar, I'll be your moderator and taking you through uh, a series of presentations and a question and answer session. Um, the presenters for today, actually two gentlemen, uh, uh, Michael Pachlatko, who is actually the Vice President uh, for Finance with Jewel Assets Europe. And Jewel Assets Europe is also part of our investor network. And Michael and his team have been uh, quite active and are still active in the, uh, in the Horizon 2020 project called the Launch uh, pro uh, Project. And that project has uh, given the world a risk assessment protocol to help de-risk uh, projects, particularly smart city projects related to uh, sustainable energy assets. And Michael will be leading us through uh, what that uh, risk assessment protocol is all about. And then he will be followed by um, a team member of his, uh, Quentin uh, Neerings, who would uh, present around, uh, let's say, the practical experiences from using that risk assessment protocol from uh, a financial actor perspective, because he's uh, affiliated with the BNP Paribas uh, Fortis. Now, before we go into uh, uh, the actual session, I just want to go through the agenda with, uh, with you all. First of all, I want to share some housekeeping rules so that we all keep this uh, neat and tidy and within time. Then I will speak a little bit, just a few seconds around what the EIP SEC marketplace actually is and what types of uh, interventions and services we provide to uh, the smart city projects across uh, Europe. And then George will take over and just uh, briefly address the topic of risk assessment, why that is an important topic for, uh, uh, for financiers of smart city uh, projects. It slightly relates to the previous topic we had in our previous uh, webinar well, that was around due uh, diligence. And then we have the two gentlemen uh, doing the presentation. So Michael, first of all, will be taking us through the risk assessment protocol itself. And then Quentin will uh, 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 give us uh, an insight of how that could be practically applied uh, within the, the context of, uh, of a bank. And then, if all goes well, we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers and some, some conclusions. Now, first of all, the, uh, the housekeeping rules. Uh, as you might find, and probably you have been in webinars before during these corona days, that you're all muted by default, actually to minimize background noise and uh, to help us uh, focus on the, on the content. But we will, do have, uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. And uh, we will then unmute yourself, but you can ask questions either by raising your hand during the Q&A session or any time during the session itself using the chat box uh, in the control panel that you see visible to yourself. It's actually on my right, probably it's on your right as well. And uh, if there are too many questions, uh, given the time, then we will get back via email, post the webinar to answer any questions that you might have. And again, you may have seen it from the splash screen right at the beginning. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be posted to uh, the Marketplace website for later uh, uh, replay. Now, what is the EIP SEC? It stands actually for the European Innovation Partnership on Smart Cities and Communities. And actually, it is a platform that brings together cities, industries, small and medium sized enterprises, investors, innovators, researchers, and many other smart city actors with a view to uh, leveraging all of the uh, R&D that's going on around smart cities and make that into sort of real life action in cities and to scale up from the innovative experiments that the, uh, the European Commission funds through its funding uh, programs. Now, what we do is we, we have organized our work into three areas. Uh, and so the, 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 the words that go along with that is the three words, explore, shape, deal. So we will help, uh, we are helping uh, smart city actors to explore existing good solutions. So we sit on a database of smart city solutions that contains both 
quantitative performance data on what, what might be achieved with smart city technologies, but also qualitative information around the lessons learned and, and good practice stories themselves. And over more, we provide uh, through that database you with a context that you might engage with to learn more about those solutions. And then the second pillar called the shape pillar is, 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 is the, the set of interventions that we have to help shape smart city projects. And we do that through a series of yeah, so-called working groups or action clusters and initiatives on various sort of hot topics in, in, in smart city land. And I invite you to, uh, to go to our website and the, the details of those will be shared at the last slide of, the, of, this, uh, of this webinar to explore what those working groups are all about. And then maybe even you can join them uh, if, you, if you want. And we do have a series of regular workshops and webinars like this one. And we provide you with tools to increase the bankability of your, uh, of your smart city project. So that's the shape arm of our, of our work. And then the third arm of our work is around creating deals. Uh, so we do organize, and we have organized actually, a face-to-face -face matchmaking event with, uh, uh, with investors, because we have set up and are setting up an investor network. Uh, we are continuing that uh, using virtual technology as well, and we are planning to do uh, have a, a next matchmaking event uh, with investors in, in June. More details later. We have an open call for concept notes, proposals uh, ready to be matched with the requirements of our investor network. So if you have a very good uh, project concept, we're happy to take those concepts, review them, and match them uh, if possible with the requirements of of our investor network and we will provide you with uh, guidance on how to create those bankable investment proposals uh, we have a web platform that's actually now being migrated to a europa uh, server to be relaunched in june but the existing web platform is available to you as as we speak now with that uh, short introduction i want to hand over to my colleague uh, george who will be sort of addressing the risk assessment and risk uh, assessment protocols from a wider perspective before we go into the the launch risk assessment protocol so george hello everyone and um, thank you alco for this introduction so as elko mentioned um my name is uh, George Almeida. I'm uh, part of the EIPSCC consortium, and I will talk a little bit about uh, why risk assessment is key for the bankability of projects. I will be quite short because uh, I want to focus on the protocol itself uh, instead of focusing on this on this thematic. Um, as you as you know. Uh, um, we uh, we have presented this before um we have divided uh, or we have created a project maturity level framework that aims to um put uh, uh, the projects that we get from the calls of four projects um to develop the matchmaking to put them under a certain project maturity level so that project maturity level goes from one where is just a potential project that has been identified to six where uh, it's ready to launch the tender and um, all the requirements have been fulfilled and what happens in the middle is that we are going to develop or uh, the project developer in the city is going to develop the, the, the project um, following steps by steps. And uh, under this step by step, one key element that it's not written here, but it always had to be in, there, in the back of the mind of the people doing that work is the risks. For each of the stages, there are several risks that must be identified analyze it and every time that it's possible be mitigate, mitigated um, for instance if we talk about the technical parts of the document of the the, the project we must focus on the technical risks and uh, and trying to understand them and see how we can if they are um, complicated risks uh, see how we can overcome them um, so what is risk analysis um, According to Investopedia, I, I like it, this um, three sentences that they have there. Um, risk analysis is just the process of assessing the likelihood of um, an adverse event occurring. So that could be different types of, uh, of events that could occur during the project lifetime. And uh, for those, uh, those events, we need to understand them and see uh, uh, what kind of risks are associated. Uh, the risk can be um, investigated and analyzed 
in two ways, uh, quantitative and qualitative. Um, so different approaches that must be taken. And I like this sentence that they had there, and I never thought about like this, but uh, it's a fact. Risk analysis is more an art than a science. And uh, the reason for this uh, uh, is one of the reasons for this is, for instance, um, the lack of uh, standards that cover all the process. Um, and this happens because the risks are so different as the projects are. So given that we have uh, very different projects, we will have very different risks. And um, we have to always keep in mind that uh, car loans exist for more than 100 years. Um, mortgage, they even, we have more data about it because they have been uh, around for, for more time. But when it comes to uh, sustainable finance, smart cities, uh, we have uh, a lack of data. We have a lack of financial performance data. That means that uh, we are not aware of all the risks that are around. And that is a problem because when we don't know the risks that might come, uh, uh, so investors or um, financiers, they will have some kind of doubts whether they should finance or not the project. And uh, how we, can we overcome this? Um, Basically, we can start using the standardization and using uh, risk assessment protocols, um, such as the ones um, that uh, Lunch will present. This is a sentence from their website that I, that I really like, because um, it's uh, just talking about standardization. If I standardize the way that I perform the risk assessment, that will encourage the market to grow and uh, will uh, be able to, to perform the securitization of projects. So make sustainable energy assets as tradable securities. And um, just the last slide, uh, because we are all aware that factories, they need standardization. But sometimes we forget that banks or investors, they are or they work like factories. So they also need standardization. And um, yeah, I will give the floor now to Michael. Uh, to present the risk assessment protocol. Um, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, George. Uh, and hello and a warm welcome also from my side. I'm very pleased to see such a significant interest in a topic that usually would be considered rather dull and dry. In the next 10, 15 minutes, I would like to introduce to you the launch risk assessment protocol, a tool that we have developed over the past year and that we believe will help accelerate project underwriting and due diligence work for all players involved in this specific sector. Um, and I do need to uh, hope that I will not be too dry on this subject. Um, First, just a few words uh, on the launch uh, Horizon 2020 project. Tool Assets acts as coordinator of this two and a half year project uh, backed by a European Commission grant and has partnered with the Dutch research organization TNO, Luxembourg based fund manager Enersafe Capital, the Irish ESCO New Energy Group, and the Belgian bank BNP Paribas Fortis. Um, altogether, Basically, we are representing an industry that fails to show its full potential. In fact, should we even stand a chance to finally be reaching the hundreds of billions of additional capital to be invested in energy efficiency upgrades in Europe, we need a vast improvement in both speed and scale. And this is exactly what the launch consortium is trying to achieve, accelerating yield closure and enabling pipeline growth also in view of creating sustainable energy projects as securitizable assets that can be traded on capital markets. Two of the key elements in this work are the launch standardized client agreement and the launch risk assessment protocol. Both are designed to support ESCOs with standardized processes and elements, but at the same time, we involve the investment community all along the way in order to ensure that we are addressing the needs of the financial world with them. I will focus my presentation on the risk assessment protocol, but as we shall see, many risk types directly relate to the standardized agreement. And this really makes these sort of twinned tools to be applied together. So how can we better assess uh, risk and how does a better uh, risk assessment help in this uh, context? 
I will try to illustrate this with a little timeline of some of the main steps involved in energy efficiency project investments. Having worked for a number of years in this exact spot between the ESCOs and the investors, we at Jewel Assets have seen time and time again how risks and the lack of transparency or information about them create friction points in this process. These can be anything from dubious assumptions about energy price growth to unclear roles and responsibilities between the ESCO and the client to the lack of clear measurement and verification procedures. We are not pointing fingers at anybody here, but it goes without saying that this often represents a high potential for frustration for all parties involved. Time is wasted, money is lost, and deals do not get financed. Now, this is our unfortunate experience on the project-by-project -project basis, but of course it will be equally relevant for other financial parties involved in an eventual securitization process such as a securitization vehicle or an eventual buyer of a security of a bond for example. What is important is to eliminate these potential friction points as quickly and early in the process as possible. We of course understand that all investors have their own methodologies, benchmarks and risk appetites and will continue to do so. What we are developing here is a tool that helps communicate the relevant information at the relevant time in a way that also contractors know that they will cover all necessary aspects with whatever financial counterparty they deal with. There are a number of advantages that we can expect from such a tool. Better risk management with a complete and standardized set of information enhanced transparency that helps to avoid nasty surprises along the way, an increased efficiency, so information will be presented ready-made to the financial players and it will be available early in the process, thus reducing overhead costs. And finally, there is also a competitive advantage. We clearly see how this could lead for both ESCOs and investors to an advantage in their own uh, sectors, particularly also in view of incorporating ESG-related information. I will be talking a little bit about this um, later on. All right, so let us now have a closer look uh, at what exactly the risk assessment protocol covers. There are a number of specific risk types we need to consider when looking at an energy efficiency project and we can categorize them broadly into three distinct groups. The exogenous risks refer to conditions and circumstances that are external to the actual project opportunity. Here we see for example regulatory, market or currency risk which are all driven by outside factors. A second group consists of endogenous risks these risk types are inherently linked to the design of the project or certain contractual or structural elements that indeed are under the responsibilities of one or several project stakeholders. Of course, not all of these risks will be in the same way important or even applicable in any given project. Still, each of them has to be assessed for a number of key questions. What is the potential risk impact? Can we quantify it and model its financial impact? Who bears the eventual consequences? Is it the contractor, the end client or the investor? How can it be mitigated? Is there insurance, for example, or can we hedge the risk? At the core, however, we see a very specific risk type that is widely considered the most important risk for investors, and this is credit risk. So I'd like to take a moment to focus on some key aspects regarding credit risk in project investments. Credit risk is essentially counterparty risk and we therefore need to assess it for all counterparties involved. At the minimum, this will be the contracting party and the ultimate beneficiary of the installed equipment and services. Credit risk refers to the likelihood of receiving timely and sufficient cash flows and therefore needs to take potential default rates into account. Usually the end client's credit risk is given more importance as it is always easier to replace a contractor or operator of the equipment than its beneficiary. 
in many cases, the installed equipment couldn't really be recuperated, either for technical reasons or simply because it wouldn't be economical. On the other hand, there are various other risk types we've covered on the previous slide that ultimately would have an impact on credit risk too. If, for example, performance risk or occupancy risk or energy price risk is shouldered by the contractor, any significant negative impact on these areas would indirectly affect its financial situation and thus increase the contractor's credit risk. It is therefore essential to assess the financial standing of the counterparties early in the process, and each investor will have their own methodology and benchmark for doing so. In certain countries or for certain companies of a certain size, external credit ratings will be available too, which would of course facilitate the assessment. Now, even though we obviously can't take away this work from the investors, we can still take preliminary steps and try to broadly understand the financial situation of the clients we are dealing with. We can consider this a sort of pre-qualification process where we screen and sort out um, unsuitable counterparties. And here on the right hand side of the screen, I have just included a number of the ratios and, and uh, tests that we have included in, in this uh, credit risk assessment part of the protocol. The source of information is always the standard financial statements, the balance sheet or the income statement. Now, how will the risk assessment protocol actually be used in practice? It will be the responsibility of the contractor to fill in the protocol for each project separately and to supply the necessary documentation for all the claims that are made within the protocol. The aim is to collect this data as early in the process as possible in order to have the whole risk-related dossier readily available for all eventual financial counterparties on the way. Now, as already mentioned before with the credit risk, the idea is to be descriptive, not to be prescriptive in this process. In other words, the launch risk assessment protocol will not provide a rating, but rather allow investors to have all the relevant information displayed in a complete, transparent and standardized way in order then for them to assess whether specific risk levels are acceptable or not. While we are clearly aiming at producing something meaningful and valuable for the investors here, we have to ensure, however, that the use of the protocol is still practical for the contractors and their clients uh, as well. So this is very much the, um, the kind of two-pronged uh, approach that we have to be taking here in the development uh, of the protocol. And while it may first seem as a bit of an overkill for a contractor to fill this protocol in for each new project separately, we have actually seen that the clear majority of risk types will eventually contain the same information across projects. That could be on technology or, for example, in the market and the regulatory environment that they are active in. So it is mostly the information related to the end client that will have to be changed from project to project. In other words, once the protocol has been filled in once, every subsequent submission should go much quicker. As you can see in this overview here as well, there are also a number of risks that directly relate to the end client agreement, the launch standardized agreement, which of course further facilitates the work for an ESCO using both tools together. I show you here quickly a screenshot of the current protocol for one individual risk type, the regulatory risk. Essentially, the risk assessment protocol is, a, is structured as a questionnaire with the same key areas covered for most risk types. It's the relevance, so how can the risk be quantified and is it relevant, relevant in this context? The responsibility, so which party would uh, actually bear the risk? Mitigation measures, if any, um, as mentioned, insurance or hedges, and then this segment on the documentation, listing all the necessary required documentation in support of the claims that are made. Eventually, we are going in the direction of also um, producing uh, 
a summary of, of key risk factors that will allow for a quick benchmarking by its readers, so that's the investors, and also a full list of the included documentation. We try to avoid wherever possible the need for lengthy explanations, but rather keep the questions to straightforward yes or no questions or asking for quantitative uh, responses. We are constantly improving on the format of the protocol, making sure it's easy to use for the contractors, but at the same time also easy to understand for the investors. As mentioned earlier, we are currently one year into the launch project and the work on the various tools is an ongoing process as we go in cycles of development, uh, feedback and testing. I would like to point out just two of the main next steps uh, in the development of this protocol. One is related to uh, ESG criteria, so non-financial, environmental, social and governance criteria. Here we see a, a strong need from the financial community to have this included as an additional risk type into the protocol. We will be asking from the contractor in the same way as for all other risk types to fill in the relevant information regarding potential ESG factors. We will make sure to align this fully with the EU taxonomy on the environmental parts. And then of course, wherever there is uh, a potential overlap with, with other risk types, for example, governance, uh, factors that are overlapping with the management risk section, we, we will uh, identify these and, and try to remove the overlaps as, as much as possible. On the other hand, we have um, a, an ongoing discussion with insurance companies on some of their standardized policies that they offer to address and mitigate various risk types, be it technical or performance risk. And so that is also an ongoing work um, that we are doing with uh, with insurance companies over the next months. Finally, just a couple of words on how you can get involved here. Um, I don't want to limit it to ESCOs and investors, of course, but maybe just uh, to address these two main categories. Um, as an ESCO, you can, of course, join us in the launch education pilot. You can stay informed on the latest developments of the launch tools. These are all uh, published on our website and are, are um, you know, there to be downloaded and, and um, we would be more than happy to have you test these as well in real life projects. So please do get in touch in case you're interested uh, and we, we, we really want to make this uh, as applied and as interactive um, as, as possible. Um, finally, we also offer in launch support in other areas, sales process, value propositions, or access to growth capital. These are all areas that you can read more about on, on our project website. As an investor, you can join the Launch Investor Board. We have already uh, more than 15 different um, uh, investors uh, on our board. We are very happy to have such a, a good um, group of experts around the table. Uh, that provide feedback on the development of the tools and also making sure that they are really most valuable, uh, designed in the most valuable way for, for them. Uh, also in this regard, we have just recently started with an ESG working group within this investor board, um, just working on the specific area of, of ESG factors and ESG risks. This is all for now. From my side, feel free to get in touch with any questions you might have and in case you're interested to, to be receiving the uh, risk assessment protocol. I would now like to give the word to uh, Quentin Erings from BNP Paribas Fortis to hear more about the bank's perspective on risk assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. So uh, I'm Quentin Erings from BNP Paribas Fortis. I am a, in a team which is active in structuration of small projects, so projects which are uh, uh, under the 50 million uh, threshold uh, in, for uh, Belgium. In this role, we, we participated in, in the launch project in order to, to be able to structure uh, and to facilitate the financing of project of energy performance projects. Uh, what and so the, it was the occasion to, to share a bit uh, our, our thoughts and our feedback on, on this. First of all, uh, there is one thing we, we have to, to differentiate in the banking world because as you speak about banks, there are often in the energy world two types of banks. Uh, you have the investment banks uh, which 
will do mostly uh, project finance uh, like a financing approach and you have the classical uh, corporate lending bank and for this is uh, mainly uh, for Belgium a uh, lending bank a corporate lending bank what are the differences between this approach these are quite huge difference the the project finance will approach will be based on future cash flows it means that they will have a quite a huge and heavy due diligence process in order to be certain to be sure or as sure as possible that these future cash flows will effectively be generated uh, for to do this most of the bank have specific teams specialized teams in the part of the investment banks and due to these specificities this kind of financing is mostly not for every bank uh, for example in belgium in my team we we are a bit of an exception in that but for most of the bank in the international bank the, the project finance approach will be only used for project above the 50 millions uh, which is for energy performance project just not so relevant because most of these projects are smaller than 50 million euro then you have the other approach the corporate lending approach uh, which it's the classical role of bank which will provide financing to talk to a company here the bank will not really I, I am a bit of exaggerating but the bank will not really look at the project what will the bank look at it's the historical record it's the, 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 the accounting data of the company and if these are good the bank will be able to lend it the advantage of this approach is it, it, it's uh, quite easy and and with not a lot of other costs uh, financing approach but this as you see these two approaches are very different because in one approach you have an easy approach but we will not look at the future cash flow or not not, not a lot to look at the future cash flow and the second approach we will, which will look at the future cash flows it's far more heavy uh, but has also its advantage and for energy performance project these two different approach it's quite a challenge and i, I will explain um, why for why in the second slide that's what for the introduction now i have to just um, give a bit explanation about the scope of uh, what we are doing for launch and uh, here the scope is really what happens after that a project has been uh, given to an esco so all the procurement process all the the the, the public uh, public competition which is done is not part of what we are speaking here here we are speaking about an ESCO we, we has uh, one a project was born an APC contract for for a company for a public authority and this ESCO wants to finance this contract we want to finance this project uh, so that's really here we are speaking about the ESCO's perspective not on the final client's perspective which has of all the all the public authorities or the, the private company it's quite important to, to add so for a banker and that's why I say EPC contract are quite difficult why it's because this kind of contracts are in fact hybrid contract with you have part of this contract we, which are in fact project performance contracts because you have performance guarantees and you have a, a need to maintain to maintain these installations these aspects are directly linked to to the performance of the esco to the performance of the project and as i said most of the time in banks these kinds of risks are assessed via uh, EV due diligence in specialized team. The other part is the risk, and as Michael said too, the credit risk, which are what the final client has to pay. And as I say, this is mostly assessed by classical lending banks, which are not really familiar with the performance risk. To assess a performance risk of a project risk so you see 
this is really the difficulty for a classic bank about EPC financing. It's because you are really mixing two types of tricks, which is which are which are generally analyzed by different teams inside the banks. What does it mean? It means that you have, as I said, two approach, which are not often uh, which are often not often mixing themselves, and so you have in front of you a banker, or or or, or you are to it, you are in front of a project finance bank. Well, if if you can reach a, a quite huge huge uh, huge amounts, in this case, this project finance bank will not really be keen on taking the counterparty risk uh, because they don't understand that. It's not their work to, to analyze a, a counterparty. On the, other, on the other way, if you are an ESCO and you are going to your bank and asking for a financing, it will be probable it will be a possibility that this that your bank will not be comfortable in taking a performance risk, a technical performance risk. And that's why you have to help the bank to assess the risks. And that's why a standardized contract, a standardized uh, risk approach, a standardized risk model could help you to structure how hard the bank looking at the risks. And it's really important to do that. And also, a SESCO for this kind of project, page, you, you have to, 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 to use a bit of pedagogy uh, in, for your banker uh, because he just cannot do that. It's not what he's used to, this kind of project. It's too complex for him. So if an ESCO is contacting its classical bank, okay, the, this classical his bank know them. So that's not really a problem. You have to give a business plan. You have to give him perspective. But all in all, it, it, it will be okay. Uh, but what your the banker of the ESCO doesn't know, it's the credit risk of the ESCO's client. And the problem is that uh, the banker are private companies, so they don't have a lot of time to assess all the risks. And so if you want to, to help the banker, you will have to provi provide him information about the risk of the, your counterparty. And so you he will have to use the same language as your banker. Second reason to do that is because the, in a bank, the person you will be, have in front of you is mail, mo, mainly not the person who will take the decision. So give to the person, to the relationship manager, the good argumentation he will have to use in front of the person we are taking the effective decision in the bank. Uh, really important. Third aspect, the techniques. Yes, in a classic bank, in a lending bank, your banker will normally, in most of the time, uh, if you have the, the chance to have a bank to, 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 which has some technical people, then, then it's perfect, but it's most, mainly, mostly not the case. In a bank, he will probably not know anything about techniques. And don't, don't, don't over give uh, your banker too much information about the techniques. What are the, what, do need the banker about techniques, it's just to have comfort on the fact that the risk of the techniques are mitigated. So the banker doesn't want information about the techniques. The banker wants to have information about how the risks of each techniques is mitigated. And that's pro it will prove him that it's, it's in their control. And so having a, a good uh, risk mitigation plan is really something uh, you could use and, uh, and which could be helpful. With all these tools, you have and you will have, be able to explain the risk at the banker. And it will give the banker uh, far more comfort uh, because for a bank, it's not really a problem to have risks. The problem is um, that if is that a banker is when a banker does not understand the risks. If you have risk and you can explain them and, and explain why it is a risk and mitigated, the, a bank could, could, could do that. They could take this risk. But if, if the banker see a risk which has not been identified and which we, and does not have any 
mitigation procedures or aspects, that could be a real problem. So some of conclusion of these small um, small hints of our of uh, a bank. First of all, you have to, to select your bank financing partners. All banks have, as, it's, uh, as it has been said previously, all investors even have different ways to look at risk, different policies, different procedures. If you are speaking about a bank or on a project, and if you don't, if you don't see a lot of support from him, of comfort from him, change your banks because it will be a pain in order to, to, to move forward in the financing of this project. Secondly, as I said, you have to give uh, your banking partners per perspectives. Projects, uh, per energy performance projects are a mostly small project of 1 million, 2 million euro. For a corporate bank, it's quite small a month. So if you want that your banker take the pain to understand your project and, 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 and move forward with you as a partner, you really have to give him perspective on future projects to, 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 to give him a vision. And then, as I said, uh, give yourself the risk and the mitigation to your banker. And that's why I think that, that standardized, standardized assessment protocol could really help in doing that, to really to structure all, all the aspects and all the, the procedures. Voila, that's a bit the, 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 the hints and the, the feedback I wanted to, to give about the, the risk in a bank, uh, which is, as, uh, as you have said, uh, sometimes some kind of an art, even if it's a bit strange to call a banker as an artist, but okay. Uh, but it, what is true, it's different for each investor, different for all bank, and so the more the information you are giving the bank about the risk and the way you, you analyze the risk, the less chance you give to the investor or the banker the place to, to, to interpret it uh, himself, all the risks. Voila, and I give the mic back to Iclo. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, Michael, for uh, for these inputs. Very, very, very useful and insightful. And also, let's say, frank as well, because indeed, uh, a frank approach is, is what we need uh, here as well. So um, if I can ask my colleagues in the, in the back office to uh, make sure that people are able to raise their hand and contribute to with any questions that they might have because they're now all um, muted. In the meantime, I can see in the question pane there have been some questions around availability of the, the presentation afterwards. Yes, we will indeed share the presentation in a follow-up message to all uh, participants uh, of, this, uh, of this webinar. So that's, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, uh, you know, to get us started, I can see a question. Uh, uh, I, can, I guess it's addressed to you, Quentin. It's a question from uh, Michael Edelstam. He's asking whether aggregation, and that's a, almost an infamous word as well, aggregation of a number of projects make it more interesting to a bank to achieve a certain volume, to achieve a certain portfolio, to make it interesting over and above the, uh, as you said, the, the small, you know, the lowish threshold of one to two million uh, euros per project. So maybe Quentin and uh, maybe uh, Michael can follow up on that question because I think it's actually quite relevant. Uh, yes, it's absolutely relevant. Uh, it depends on the, the type of bank you are speaking with. If you're speaking with the project finance department of the banks, aggregation will, will certainly be relevant, but do not forget that you will have to, to reach a, a 50 million euro threshold of investment in order to interest uh, a project finance department in an international bank. Uh, local banks have, have a lower threshold. Uh, secondly, uh, the challenge is to build the portfolio. Uh, because, as I said, a project finance department is not really comfortable with the counterparty risk. Indeed, with the risk diversification, you can lower this risk, but it has to be built, uh, and that's really the challenge. Uh, on the other hand, a local bank or a lending bank, corporate lending bank, could be interested in the project of one of two million euro, uh, certainly, especially if uh, the ESCO is a client of, is known uh, by this bank. But then uh, you have to do a work. Uh, 
there is a bit of work in order to to create a, a sort of guidelines with with your banking partner in order to to standardize the way this these projects are financed and uh, and so you have to to really create a, a partnership with your bank it's really needed if you are not able to do that it will be really hard to finance it via the banking channel um, and and so it's really i think the one million two million project could be interesting for 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 lending corporate lending banks less for project finance bank in in, in both cases you really have to to, to explain and to provide more information than usual to your bank um, because the challenges are, are different. I hope that uh, my explanation was, was good. Thank you, Quentin. Um, so uh, is, is Michael uh, from Jules Assets uh, having a view on aggregation from your point of view? Sure, or... Yeah, I mean, I, I can add to what uh, Quentin has been uh, referring to from the bank's perspective and, and maybe just uh, refer to um, some of the you know most active types of investors that we are having in our network and these are usually some dedicated funds um, investing in sustainable energy uh, projects it is quite diverse we see funds with min minimum requirements as well of, of a million or two um, others with lower uh, thresholds of, of maybe only a hundred thousand um, euros but the key of course is really um, to show uh, a, a potential for aggregation or a potential for pipeline as well. So an ESCO that can bring uh, a number of projects of at least the same you know, technology, the same structure, maybe not exactly the same end client, but possibly it could be also with you know, a hotel chain that um, you know, a number of, of actual buildings and a number of actual hotels are la lined up in a pipeline and eventually will lead to some economies of scale because this is indeed of course the, the key aspect here uh, an investor would normally not just touch a single 100,000 euro project um, as a standalone opportunity because the overhead costs would simply just get too high and it would simply not pay off eventually or the cost of capital would just simply get too too high for, for, for the contractor and the client. So project aggregation definitely is uh, an, an important and, and, and also valuable uh, aspect in, in this regard and the investors in, in, in this network that we are looking at are indeed um, doing this all the time and looking for, for such um, ways to aggregate. And what we of course then try is to provide the tools here with the risk assessment or the standardized agreement to even further allow for uh, commingling of such assets um, that, that also then you know respect the same terms and conditions with the clients, treat risk in the same way and so on and so forth. Thank you. Um, there is a, actually a question also around the, uh, clearly around the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis that's now on, on, ongoing. In a, is that, you know, clearly that is affecting, the, let's say also the, the risk profiles and uh, ri you know, risk appetites and, and credit ratings of, of organizations. So is there any sort of recent, uh, very up-to-date view on that? Is, is that going to be included somehow in, in, in launch or does BNP Paribas have a view on this in relation to, to this risk assessment protocol? It depends really on the sector, on the type of project. If you are in an um, energy production project, so in a photovoltaic project or, or something like that, it will not have a lot of consequences uh, because this kind of project are a uh, small, really low sensibility to to, to, to the risk link it to the work of it. If you are in an uh, energy performance project uh, where your cash flow are depending uh, on a counterparty, as I said, uh, it's really be linked, uh, the, the importance of the, the assessment of the credit risk of the counterparty will have a lot of importance. Uh, and so it could depend. Uh, local authorities, it will depend on on the risk appetite of your financing partner, first of all, and then on the, the risk profile of, of the counterparty. Uh, even with with huge debts for most of, for a lot of banks, not all, but uh, public authorities will, will be considered as having a lower risk 
not for all the countries, but, but for Netherlands, for France, Dutch, Germany, Belgium, it will be so. Uh, for uh, and then about if you are a private company, if if uh, you the beneficiary of the, the energy saving measure are, is a private company, it really be depending on on, uh, on on the credit assessment that the bank will do, the financing partner will do, and preferably with the help of the ESCO. Uh, and that's why again the risk assessment could really be interesting it's to, to provide the, to the esco the first tools as michael said to help him to, to assess himself uh, the final clients the counterparty because if the esco is going to a financing partner with a really bad counterparty he will himself lose some of its credibility and that's something we, we you you prefer to avoid Okay, thank you. So, um, in, the, in the interest of creating some interactivity, I can see some people who actually have further questions. Uh, can I invite Daniel Magnet to voice that, that question? Yeah, um, uh, excuse me. Uh, good afternoon. I'm just. Maybe, uh, maybe you can sort of state your name and your affiliation before asking the question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Daniel Magnet, Ivo. Uh, um, efficiency valuation organization. I just uh, wanted to ask uh, the question about your uh, standardization on MNV techniques. Uh, usually we, we do consider MNV uh, as a good uh, mitigation procedure when uh, you're dealing with uh, energy performance contract or any type of air guaranteed performance commitment. Uh, how do you address uh, in your uh, standardization, how do you address uh, MNV? Um, I, I guess that, that was a question for me. Um, the, uh, the way it is addressed is that we basically require a contractor to fully disclose uh, the MNV plan, so the, the algorithms and procedures that are put in place for uh, evaluating uh, the, the project's performance um, over the lifetime, um, we recommend to be following also international standards. There is, a, of course, IPMVP, there is a, an ISO standard as well. Um, we are not, again, prescribing any particular approach uh, in, in this regard, but it is uh, all about uh, ensuring that it is fully disclosed uh, in a transparent way. Um, so an investor gets the necessary information um, right away. And there are no surprises um, also in this regard, because of course, measurement and verification is a, a very delicate area where where surprises would even occur after a deal has actually been financed and the project is, is, is in the operating stage. Thank you. Uh, you know, my question was more about uh, the, the way you, I mean you, the other party is evaluating this MNV plan. Uh, as you just said, that the MNV plan could be something quite uh, difficult to understand or delicate. Uh, so it requires on on the other party side needs a certain knowledge about these uh, ISO or IPMVP protocol. And uh, how do you? Uh, what are your suggestions on uh, how the other party, that means the uh, client or the bank evaluator, uh, it would be able to and to fully understand uh, the MNV plan? Uh, for uh, I will speak on the bank's point of view. It depends on on the level of maturity of knowledge of, of your banking partners. If you have in front of you somebody which knows a bit of techniques, he will be able to understand an MVP, MVP plant. But uh, I think that in most of the times times you will not have such this kind of guy in front of you. So uh, a banker will not go really deep in the techniques or in the MV plant. What the banker will, will have to, to, to and it's what, uh, well, it's what I mean when I say do not go too, too, too long on the techniques set themselves, go more on the mitigation. What the banker will, 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 will want to see if it's not really the whole details on, on, on the MV plan, uh, measurement and verification plan, plan but it's more 
answers on what happens if uh, the final client, the public authorities, does not agree on the calculation of the ESCO. That's the kind of question your banker will, will, will ask. He will not ask about, oh, do you calculate that? He will ask more, what has happened if the cl final client is, do, does not agree on that? And then in the contract, you will have to, to provide an answer to that. And that's why also a standardized contract could, could, could help in order to, to have these kind of uh, feedback loops. Uh, and, and for example, uh, to, to, to have the presence, to define, to define the fact that, that you have to have a moderator, a uh, facilitator, which a third party, a neutral third party, which, which will be able in case of, of uh, disagreement between the, the final client and the HESCO to, to, to provide a neutral answer, which could not be, 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 be put in doubt. That, that's this kind of things uh, in a classical bank will have want to have, but they will not uh, speak again only for as a banker. Uh, they will not go deep in the, the technical details because they will not be, be have the, the te technical competencies in order to do that. Oh yes, Thank maybe, you. but with uh, with external due diligence. And uh, as Michael said, if you add all the external due diligence, then you you you, you crash the the, the financials of uh, the project. Okay. All right. So thanks. So thank you. In the interest of time, let's. Uh on to one, one final question. I do invite everybody to post their questions in the chat so that we do have a record that we can co come back to. Uh, so maybe there I can see a question from Bernard uh, Gindreau. Are you okay to ask the question? Yes, and uh, good afternoon and thank you for this uh, very interesting webinar. Yes, it's, it's not really a question, but following the meeting we had in last February and in, in Brussels for the General Assembly, um, or annual meeting, sorry, um, we agreed and proposed uh, f also to organize by the end of the year, probably in November during the General Assembly meeting, uh, a workshop dedicated to our standardization in support of these, uh, let's say, financial uh, financial scheme or uh, issues for, for cities and communities. And when I say uh, we are, uh, we have already been in touch with uh, Jules Assets, uh, Europe, but also Jessica and Federica so far. And uh, the idea is to to have this organization um, um, between the Sentinelic and at sea and the sector from for smart and sustainable cities and communities. The action cluster on integrated planning policy and regulation. I'm I'm an initiative leader and in collecting all the um, let's say expression of needs for for standardization development. So I, I would really suggest to to stay in close touch all of us and and trying to start elaborating. What could be the um, uh, the content, the scope of such an event? Uh, I think it's very useful. We have seen also in in the energy sector, our the uh, Energy Efficiency Financial Institution Group was finally very very successful, but it took years before we we moved to something uh, agreed, a standard design, standardized scheme or guidance uh, that also allows speaking the same language between decision makers and, and investors. So. Standards will definitely play a role. I fully agree with that. And I, I, I pr propose to stay in touch uh, in that sense and, and see how we could move ahead with this organization. Thank you, Bernard. So thank you for that message uh, from an important body as, uh, that you represent. I just want to give the final uh, question to Loïc, who has been waving uh, for some time now. Uh, could you brief, briefly state your question? Because we do have a few minutes left and we have some closing messages as, as, as well. So. Loïc, if, if you are ready, then uh, keep it brief for us. Uh, I'll give you the floor. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for a, a really interesting uh, webinar and some really interesting perspectives. Um, I was just curious to know, um, Quentin, what uh, your and uh, other investors' views were on sort of uh, the customer end user using a uh, using a bank guarantee to work around any uh, uh, credit credit issues thank you Loïc, for that question it's uh, perfectly valid guarantees in a bank point of view uh, the value of the guarantee will depends on the, the the credibility the bank credibility of the the bank of the institution who are giving the guarantees but yes it's it's a way to securitize um, the the credit so for the financing yes it could be 
Absolutely. Thank you, Quentin. Great, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so in interest of, of time, uh, we have a, a lot more questions. We don't have time for that. I just uh, uh, propose to proceed with the final, uh, you know, final uh, remarks on this on this webinar. But do rest assured that we will come back to you and try to answer the questions that you might have, both the marketplace team as as well as the people from uh, from launch. Um, so, if if you are having a smart city project concept but lack the finance so come to us come to our website submit your uh, project concept note uh, the url is available there we will then assess it uh, using uh, jo what george presented the, the project maturity level model and try to match it with uh, with the uh, requirements of the investor network as i stated earlier I think it's it's uh, a main reason of existence as a marketplace to to scale up uh, uh, smart good smart city project concepts to find uh, find finance for it. So we are there to 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 help. Um, also, I want to draw your attention to uh, and as I said it before, this is actually a series of webinars. Our next webinar will be uh, on delivery models uh, and, and funding and procurement. Uh, related topics for smart cities. It will be hosted by um, by our partner ICLAI. It's scheduled to take place on the 18th of June. Uh, just so so pencil that into your diary. And we also want to you know have a sort of big bang thing be before the summer. Uh, we are organizing a masterclass, uh, meaning that we want to bring together those people who do have a let's call it a semi mature uh, a project concept and work together with a number of experts in, in a group, virtually obviously in these days, uh, to uh, increase the chances of finding finance for that for that project. Uh, so uh, we are sort of planning that, uh, working hard in the in the background to organize it. Uh, date not yet established, but will be somewhere mid 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 June. Uh, just so keep in touch with us, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, but also keep in touch with uh, what the uh, the launch people have uh, for you available. There is a community. Uh, they have a website as uh, as Michael already uh, uh, suggested, launch2020.eu, easy to remember. And they have their social media channels as as well. And they as well have a have a webinar on, uh, on sales processes and uh, marketing messages how they could help accelerate the uh, the closure of deals. Again, the date for that is not yet established, uh, but it will be uh, uh, somewhere in this, somewhere in this, this month. Then my final uh, slide is around staying in touch. Uh, this is the URL I promised you, eu-smartcities.eu. That's where you can find the, the call for project concept notes, the availability, you know, the, 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 the opportunity to sign up to the newsletter. And the various social media handles are there on this slide as well. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention on behalf of the EIP SEC Marketplace team, on behalf of myself, Ilko Kreisga, and my colleague George, on behalf of uh, the presenters of this webinar, Michael of uh, Jules Assets and uh, Quentin of uh, uh, BNP Paribas uh, Fortis. Uh, I think it has been very worthwhile, lots of interaction, lots of unanswered questions. But again, we uh, we want to come back to that uh, uh, later on in the next few days uh, for you. This has been recorded, so you can replay if you miss something. Uh, the, the slides will be shared, so everything will be available for you. So I want to thank you for your attention and stay safe. Bye bye.